Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 14, The Specter of Student Debt. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today, Sam? Doing great. Can't wait to talk about student debt. <laughs> As someone who is a victim of it, I think you probably are the best uh Subject matter expert we've ever had on any of our shows. If I'm an expert, I don't know that much about it. So, I mean, they, they're, they, I, I owe them. I know that. So that's, that's much I know. Well, you might not be an expert, but you're definitely a victim of it. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, we are talking about the pandemic of student debt. Why is it a problem in the United States? We'll talk about a brief history of student debt. And we'll take a look at what's driving the rise in student debt these days. And then we'll take a look at possible solutions to this problem plaguing today's youth and what the future of student debt looks like. Before we do that, though, I would invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We are listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, Amazon, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. Uh, I would also invite everyone to give us your feedback right in. Uh, tell us how we're doing. Give us your, your suggestions for topics you'd like us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we are facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at insights into things, or you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Ready to get into it? Yep. All right. <music> so, what is student debt? There is a ton of research out there. Uh, or a ton of information, I should say, out there that I came across in doing the research for today's show. Most of what we're going to talk about today comes from FirstRepublic.com. They say student debt pay, uh, plays a significant role in the lives of many Americans. The cost associated with higher education continues to increase year over year, and for many, this translates to a heavier re reliance on loans to bridge the gap. Consequently, Outstanding U.S. student loan debt reached $1.7 trillion at the end of 2020, according to the Federal Reserve, which is an all-time high. To put that into perspective, that's roughly the GDP ranking of Canada, the 10th highest ranked country in the world by GDP. How does, like, that number to me is just astronomical. Mm -hmm. What's the impact of that number to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's just like you said, once you get... Once you get past, like, honestly, like 100, it's hard for me to fathom that number. Um, but when we talk about trillions, it's it's like when you look at the national debt, too. It's just these numbers are astronomical. You can't even wrap your head around them, yeah. let alone the notion of being able to pay that off, which is just it seems impossible. Yeah, but the thought that if we wanted to pay off the, nas the, the national student debt right now, that's more money than Canada mm -hmm. can generate in a year. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's ridiculous. It's a great way to intro the topic, too, framing it in that, like, how big of a of a, a beast it is. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it seems, when you talk in numbers that size, it seems kind of insurmountable, yeah. really. 
Uh, so we have a couple other uh, student loan debt statistics. Uh, the national average per student is about $39,000. Uh, the states with the highest student loan debt, number one coming in is Washington, D.C. Uh, their average student loan debt is $54,400 a year. Uh, just below that is Maryland with $42,700. Uh, age groups with the most student loan debt are 18 to 29-year-olds. Uh, 34% of that age group have student loan debt, which makes sense because there are people either going into college or coming out of it. Uh, more than half of college-educated adults have student loan debt. That's 65% of people. Uh, 6% of borrowers who owe more than $100,000 in student loan debt, including the 2% owing more than 200000 account for a third of all outstanding student loan debt. So uh, a lot of people <laughs> owing a lot of money. <laughs> uh, the vast majority of those borrowers who owe more than 100000 took out loans for graduate school. Uh, loans associated with grad school account for about 50% of the outstanding student loan debt. The other half belongs to the 75% of borrowers who took out loans for two- or four-year degrees. Uh, and then finally, the U.S. student debt has increased by more than 100% over the past 10 years. So we're looking at the numbers are only getting higher, and that's why we have the highest in 2020 with $1.7 and, and And that's another you know, alarming statistic to have anything go up 100% over the course of 10 years. Yeah. Has the quality of your education – increased at the same proportional rate i don't know that's a good question i mean i've only been in college for three years now we're going i'm going into my senior year um but that large amount of increase it seems impossible that there would be a reflection in education that would meet that as well yeah and and you know the business side of me looks at this and wants to say all right what's the cost benefit analysis if i'm paying a hundred percent more over the last 10 years is the salary that I'm taking when I come out of that college raising 100% more? And statistically, it's not. Salaries are not keeping pace with the current economic scale. Yeah. So you're paying all this much more for an education, but you're not getting the compensation on the back end of that to justify that cost. So there's a massive loss of investment here. Like how long do you think you're going to be in debt – with college debt, I mean, judging by what I'm seeing now with my bills and things for the years, I'll probably I'm probably in that average, you know, 40k range for what I'm going to owe back. Um, the bigger question is, I'm going into a field that hopefully I'll find a job quickly. I'm going, I'm planning on going into the radio field, anything like that. Um, so hopefully I'll find a job and they'll just garner my wages. <laughs> That's going to be my plan essentially. <laughs> um, now, I know some people that are going into medical fields, so that's they're going into grad school, so that, that's half of those loans there that people owe. Um, and those jobs are obviously – you end up spending a lot more and you end up owing a lot more debt, but you're pretty much guaranteed a job because the world always needs doctors and, and whatnot. Right. Um, so I think it really depends on just what you're looking to do post-college and how long you want to stay in school and then how much you're going to pay too. Well, and and like I look at it from – I don't know. I, I kind of try to tie it to more everyday things. So I think, okay, what's the the next closest thing I have to uh, a forty thousand dollar debt? And I think, okay, if I buy a car and I finance a car, I'll finance a car for five years. After five years, three years maybe, depending on how much of a, pay, a you know monthly payment I want to do. But let's say five years is, is pretty much I think on average, I'll pay my car off after five years. Are you going to have your student loan debt paid off after five years? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not, no. And you look at student loan debt when it comes to your postgraduate schools where you're looking at around 200000 in debt that you're going to have. So now you're looking at the cost of a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So even if I look at it from a mortgage standpoint, I'm going to pay that over 30 years. So are you going to finance your student debt over a 30-year period? I mean, I know people that are in their <laughs> 40s and even 50s that are still paying off their student debt. And that, I mean, sure, that's a that's a financial question because it's going to depend on your income and, and your ability to make those payments. But it can go that long, and especially it's going to depend on what level of education you decided to go with. So let's stay, <clears throat> let's stay on that topic just for a second there. So if I go to get a, a mortgage and I'm buying a $200,000 house – I have to have an established credit history. I have to have an established income. And I have to prove that I'm not a credit risk for them to give me a loan. And depending on how risky I am, determines what my percentage rate is. What, as a student, did you have to produce to show that you're not a credit risk when it came to getting loans 
for school. Well, often they have your parents go sign, which <clears> helps <throat> because then they become responsible for that debt too. And that kind of lends credibility to you. Um, I applied to college. <laughs> so um, I don't know how it works for grad school because I don't have any, you know, aspirations of, of going down that path. But it wasn't as rigorous as, as a test as that of, right. you know, going for a mortgage. It was much more apply to the school, get into the school. Okay. You're pretty much you can just get loans and there's not right. that long of a, of a approval process. It's more about how much do you make so that we know how much to give you. And I think that's kind of the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that <clears throat> the process itself isn't nearly as rigorous as it is to make sure you're not at credit risk, to make sure you're capable of paying it back. Mm -hmm. There's almost an assumption of, oh, well, pay us whatever we ask for and then – We'll make sure you get an education to get a good job that you can pay that back. Yeah, and it's I imagine it probably is designed that way because people going into college, they don't want to think about after college when they're going to have to pay all this back. They want to get their education. They want to, you know, if they have a career in mind, they want to get to that as fast as possible. So they'll take any loans they have to. Sure, sure. And, and I think one of the indirect consequences of this is that you're seeing um, the number of people that choose to go into a vocational profession – significantly increasing over mm -hmm. those that are going to college. I thought about that. I mean, I was my freshman year in college, I took mostly gen eds and I was like, this is not what I want to do. So I started looking at broadcasting schools and I seriously considered it in my sophomore year transferring and just going to broadcasting school because, um, excuse me, uh, going to broadcasting school. Cause a lot of the people that I look up to in the area that are broadcasters either didn't go to college or went to broadcasting school. And it just seemed like, you know, that's exactly what I want to do. Why not just do that? Right. Um, but I ended up rethinking it because, uh, you know, just having the degree, you know, you talk yourself into it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'll probably talk more about that later. But just the mindset of kind of just obs obs accepting that as a notion, you know, right. you kind of just become okay with it. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a friend of mine, her son, um, they had groomed him for, for going to college all through his high school career, his grades and all the extracurricular stuff and the clubs and all that stuff. And when he got to his senior year in high school and saw how much it was going to cost, he realized he couldn't afford it. Yeah. And he didn't want to be in debt for, you know, the majority of his life. Right. So he decided instead of going to college for accounting or business administration or whatever, he was going to be an electrician. And he went off and he, he went through a vocational school. He joined in a, a guild and, you know, is under an apprenticeship now. And he's making more now within less than four years of the time he would have spent in college. He's making more now than if he'd come out of college with a four-year degree. And he's just starting out yeah. in his profession without all that debt. Yeah. I don't know. I think it, it depends on, you know, we get into deeper questions of how do you measure success? What do you want from your educational career? And I think that when once you – once you figure out those answers for yourself, then you can kind of decide, do I really need college? Do I really need to do this? Right. Uh, in my case, yes. <laughs> but in that guy's case, no, he didn't need to do that. If he if he enjoys being an electrician and he gets satisfaction from that work, there's no reason for him to go to college. He can do exactly what you said and not have to worry about debt, which is almost not unheard of, but rare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least and, with my generation. And it's 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 a very valid point you make that it is. It's very situational and very specific to the individual. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of the intro to the topic that we're talking about. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to look at a brief history of how student debt has evolved in the United States. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com.
Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow. We're talking student debt today. So let's just take a quick brief history of, of what student debt has looked like in the United States. Student debt really didn't come into to being until around 1840. The first student loans in the U.S. were offered exclusively to students at Harvard in 1840. Public students didn't uh, public student loans didn't arise until the 20th century. So it's kind of a whole new concept as far as taking loans to go to college. And you know, the instance of people going to college didn't really increase too much until around the 1940s. So in the, in the two decades prior to the institution of federally guaranteed student loans, the U.S. experienced a significant increase in college attendance, thanks in part to the GI Bill in 1944. So fulfilling the need for affordable higher education, the GI Bill subsidized, or in some cases completely covered the cost of college education for nearly half the Americans returning from World War II. We jump forward to 1972, <clears throat> and the HEA was amended to ensure the HEA being the something that was up top there that I didn't <laughs> talk about. The Higher Education Act of 18, 1965. Sorry. Everybody knows it. It's one of the big bills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're listening to this show, you should already yeah. know that. <laughs> so, so the Higher Education Act was amended to ensure – that education programs whose students were receiving financial assistance and student loans did not discriminate based on gender. I'm sure they didn't discriminate based on anything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's an evolving process, yeah. okay? <laughs> so by 77, uh, 76, 77, all undergraduate students became eligible for Pell Grants. Together, these two popular programs further increased college attendance rates by providing financial assistance to individuals who previously could not obtain it. So the focus so far at that point was not um, controlling student debt, not controlling the cost of education. It was making education more available to, to those who wouldn't be able to do it because of discriminatory practices or financial difficulties and stuff like that. So up until the 1970s, mid to late 70s, the drive really was to enable students at that point. Yeah, so looking into the 80s now, <clears throat> these are when things sort of start to turn sour. Uh, 1986, parents and students had incurred nearly $10 billion in federal student loans, which is funny now that we're up to $1.7 trillion. Yeah, right? $10 billion is a drop in the bucket, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, then considered then an outrageous amount. Uh, that same year, more than one quarter of student borrowers owed more than $10,000 in student loan debt. Uh, adjusting for inflation, that's about $21,000 today. Uh, so this is sort of where you start to see that the, this is sort of getting out of hand. <laughs> uh, and, and it's in the 1990s. Uh, student loan debt begins to skyrocket. In 1993, the average debt of a bachelor's degree was approximately $9,000. Uh, and within just five years, it was $15,000. And by 2003, it was almost uh, $20,000, coming in at $17,500. Uh, and then finally, into the 2000s, today the average uh, loan debt, which we already mentioned, is roughly $30,000. Uh, though one recent study by the Fidelity Investments puts that figure closer to $35,000. Approximately 20% of U.S. households currently owe student loan debt, uh, as do 40% of people younger than 35, which is Kind of wild. <laughs> Almost half of people younger than 35 owe student debt. Uh, this means an increase of nearly 200% of overall student loan debt over the last 20 years. 200% in just 20 years. Uh, as of 2012, total student debt has surpassed $1 trillion. And, and that's, that's astronomical. It really is just that growth rate. Now, my first question there is, what's driving that cost increase? Is it the cost of education? Is it the financing side of things? What do you, where would you pin the blame there? I mean, I, I don't really understand economics, but it seems like if more people are going to be able to get an education, then from a business standpoint, because colleges are businesses, then their market base is wider, right? So they can drive up that cost. And especially once college becomes a social norm, where it's, you're just expected to go to college, essentially, then that ensures their business model even more because people want to go to college and they can charge whatever they want. <laughs> well, yes, to a certain extent, I agree with the principle of economies of scale here. So 
back in the 1870s when, you know, maybe 2% of the population went to college, college educations should therefore have been exceedingly expensive. But now when you have such a large percentage of people that are, you know, think of, think of, uh, the, uh, Ford Model T. Okay. So prior to mass production of, of automobiles, they were very specialized, very hand built, very unique. A uh, couple of them rolled off the, uh, you know, plant, f- uh, per month. So as a result, they were very expensive to cover your overhead. Well, when the Model T comes around and you're rolling hundreds of these off the assembly line per day, you can now produce them, thanks to economies of scale, you can produce them much cheaper and then distribute that overhead cost across many more customers. And I would have thought that same model would have translated into your education system, where the more students you have, the lower that tuition rate should be. Logically, that'd be nice. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it went that way, though. Um, I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that. I guess because as the debt numbers increase too, does that allow for you know, are the are the higher tuitions not really questioned because it it just happens so quickly over time? I don't know. Um, it would be nice if that logic applied, where if the more people went to college, the cheaper it was. <laughs> but it seems like it's the opposite. It, it does, and. You know, then I have to take a look at what's the cost of college. What has gone up so dramatically for college education? Is it technological advancements? Is it the cost of um, campuses? Is it is it is it property related? Like what has happened in the last twenty years at your local college that would make it so much more expensive to go? I'm not sure. I mean. If they're dealing with more money, maybe they just feel they need to spend more money on things that maybe they don't necessarily need, you know, new facilities that might look nice and might provide for people that use them, but do we really need them? Or or large structures, um, you know, like parking garages and things like that. Are these things necessary? And maybe they're just spending that money because they have it, and that encourages the need for more money <laughs> to keep doing that. I don't know. It, yeah, like it's a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. That That makes a lot of sense. And I also have to look at these colleges that are very athletically driven. Mm-hmm. You know, all your your Big Ten uh, colleges and your Ivy League colleges where you're, you're bringing in a significant income from the sports and athletics that are happening at your college. Why isn't that going into lowering, lowering the t- cost of tuition for your students? Yeah. I mean, that's we could do a whole other show on, on college sports like that. I mean, they just had the – NCAA ruling yep. where they can get money from their image, which is nice. But, but that, the schools still can't pay them. Yeah, yeah. And the school's still getting a ton of money, especially big schools like that. Right. Just on like the broadcast rights alone. So. And that's what blows my mind is they're, they're bringing in money hand over fist to the point that you've got college stadiums that are mm-hmm. more well-appointed than professional stadiums these yep. days. Yeah, I I don't know. When I look at it, it I I look at it very cynically, and it just seems like they're these are businesses first and educational institutions second, and they are very greedy. Yeah, <laughs> and it just seems like they want to get as much money as possible out of people. So Forbes did do a study on what's driving the increases in higher education. Now now this study was done September of 2020, and their conclusion. College is expensive. <laughs> Good work for us. Uh, that was helpful. Uh, they said since 1999, since the 1999 to 2000 academic year, the net price of tuition, fees, room and board at a public four-year college has increased 68%. 68% in 20 years. That's, that's insane. The amount borrowed to go to college each year has doubled in the same time. And today, the cumulative federal student loan debt is over $1.54 trillion, more than double the amount of 2010. That's, that's insane. <laughs> uh, they say that much of the focus around student debt is around rising tuition and for good reason. As states disinvested in higher education, tuition increase across, increased across the country. Published tuition at public four-year colleges rose by 36% from 2008 to 2018, and in many states, tuition rose even more. Today, most student funding 
from states is 8.7% less than it was before the Great Recession, which should be a warning sign given the current economic situation. So there's a good driving force there that we're not talking your Ivy League schools. We're talking your state-sponsored schools. In New Jersey, we're talking um, your Rowans, your Rutgers, ones that, that get funding from the state. Mm-hmm. The state has now cut back because of economic concerns. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. States cut the funding, so the colleges have to raise tuition. Now, do they have to raise it by 68% in 10 years? I don't know. <clears throat> well, not when you're only cutting it by 8.7%. Yeah, exactly. How do you justify that? Yeah. So many have proposed making public college tuition free, which I don't think I'd argue with that. But that alone won't address student debt going forward because tuition isn't the only driver of student debt. The total cost of college also includes living expenses like textbooks and room and board, regardless if a student lives on campus or not. Living costs actually are more expensive than the sticker price of tuition. In fact, tuition and fees only make up 48% of the total cost of college at a public four-year college. At public two-year colleges, it's even smaller. It's an even smaller share at 29% with living costs almost making up two-thirds of the cost to attend. So you were living on campus your first year. What? How did that go down? That's something that we didn't even talk about. Like, you're taking out your college loans, but you're also, like, renting an apartment, basically. And, uh, you know, I only did it for one year. Um, It just wasn't for me, and I live close enough to campus that it's not really necessary. And it was very expensive, living on campus at least. I mean, there's options – where you can like <clears throat> just get an apartment off campus that I think those might be cheaper, especially if you have roommates, you, you split that cost. But yeah, a lot of that cost is coming from living there because it is a secondary apartment rental essentially. And, uh, and it's really great for some people, you know, you're living on campus you're in the, where I was, I was in the heart of campus. So you can get pretty much anywhere quickly. So if there's a convenience factor, there's a social factor because if you have a lot of friends on campus or you're part of a fraternity or a sorority, you have easy access to that or any clubs you're on on campus. So there's definitely benefits. It's just is it worth – again, it's a, it's a personal decision. Is it worth the, in my opinion, very high cost that room and board is going to run you? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Now, when you stopped living on campus, did your cost go down significantly? Yeah, yeah it did. By these kind of percentage numbers? Yeah, roughly. I don't remember exactly. Like I can, I would have to look at my actual bill because you can see all that. But yeah, definitely there was a, a decent chunk that was taken out because I was no longer living on campus. That's a very good point. So they say that covering tuition alone won't eliminate the need for many students to borrow money. Many of the existing, quote, free college proposals would continue the Pell Grant program and allow low-income students to use the grant to, to cover living costs which would help low-income students. So a lot of the financial support that's out there now will would still continue, even though eliminating tuition fees isn't going to be the end-all, be-all, but there are still other methods out there to assist students. Yeah, that's another thing. I was looking at my bill recently, like I mentioned, and it goes tuition, and then it just says fees, and that's like a third of the cost. It's like, what are fees? And, you know, I'm sure you can, if you ask, they'll break it down for you. But it's just, it's, it's strange seeing, all right, I can, I understand what tuition is. That's my, I'm paying you to go to the school. What are fees and where are they going? And it's like, that's where you get into why is this costing so much? And it really makes you wonder, especially if they're fees for things that you aren't using. Well, and you know, you, you get that sort of thing on utility bills and stuff like that, where, you know, they they try to hide all the costs. But when you're talking, $1.5 $1.5 billion, <laughs> you need to kind of be a little more yeah. upfront with these. So what other factors are there that we have to weigh in? Uh, so there's the uh, graduate school. Uh, in 2019, the number of loans dispersed for graduate school accounted for 16% of all federal student loans issued. Uh, while they were a small number of loans, they actually accounted for 41% of the dollars dispersed. Uh, that's because of the amount graduate students borrow because graduate school is really expensive <laughs> no matter what level you're going for. Um, while many often talk about borrowers with six figure student debt, that's not undergraduates. According to federal data, the average debt for a bachelor's degree, uh, is about 27 K. We've talked about that before. Uh, that's because they're cheaper, but also there are strict federal limits on undergraduate borrowing. The same federal data shows that there is only one degree level where the median bar exceeds six figures. And that's for your doctorate. So for law or medical school. Uh, On top of all of this, another driver of the rise in student loan debt is the sheer number of people going to college, kind of like we were talking about. There's just more access to it. 
Uh, so because of that, uh, the borrowing has also increased. Undergraduate enrollment has increased by more than 3.5 million students since 2000, and more people are going to graduate school as a result of that. From 2000 to 20, uh, 2018, uh, enrollment for graduate school increased to 41 or increased by 41 percent. The rise in cumulative debt looks astounding, but it's also important to consider all pieces of context that contribute to that increase. If people really want to eliminate student debt, it will mean finding a way to cover graduate school as well, in addition to the expensive uh, living costs. And no plan exists to ensure that all students can enroll at Harvard at free of charge. So it, it's, it comes down to idealism, right? You would like these things to be free, but it's in the real world, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, and I don't think most students would are shooting for free college. I think the vast majority of students who carry student debt loan at this point in time are just looking for reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. And the numbers that we're talking about so far kind of prove that these costs are well beyond reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being able to go to college is definitely a privilege. And it's good that more people are able to do it. And it just so happens that that access comes with a literal and figurative cost of, of just being in debt. Uh, but if that means that somebody that normally, you know, 30 or 40 years ago wouldn't have been able to go to college that can now, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I just think that, like you said, those numbers are ridiculously high and don't need to be that high. Yeah. And I don't think anybody expects to be debt free when they get out of college, but you got to make sure that the increases in debt kind of are warranted for what you're getting out of it. Yeah, you're not just bleeding people dry. Yeah, and that's really what it seems like at this point. So we're going to take another quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk about some possible ways to address the student loan problem. <music> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back, everybody. We are talking about student debt today. Uh, so some ways to address the student, let, uh, student loan debt problem. Uh, this is coming from the University of Washington. Uh, there's the Student Loan Fairness Act. The Student Loan Fairness Act proposes to tie interest rates to the Federal Reserve discount window rate. I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm not an economist, but that sounds like it might be a good thing. <laughs> uh, student loan borrowers the, are currently uh, paying nine times higher than the banks are able to borrow for. These rates would apply to federal subsidized Stafford loans. Uh, the Student Loan Fairness Act would offer borrowers the 10-10 loan repayment plan, which limits the payment on student loans to 10% of discretionary income. Those is, this is already offered with the income-based repayment, which I think I mentioned earlier when I was joking that they're just going to take from my wages. <laughs> uh, one of the big differences is that the proposed 10-10 repayment also offers a maximum capitalization of 10% of interest over the loan that was taken out. This means that your loan balance will never surpass your original balance plus 10%. The Student Loan Fairness Act would allow borrowers a year in which they would be able to convert their private student loans uh, into federal loans if they qualify. And even if you don't qualify for the conversion, the mere fact that this option exists will force private lenders to work with their borrowers and offer programs to parallel what is offered in federal programs. Uh, and then finally, the Student Loan Fairness Act offers forgiveness to public sector employees after only 60 months. Uh, so that just I – don't, I don't understand the larger terms, but in general, that sounds like it would be a good thing. So to kind of put this into perspective, when you go and you get a – uh, mortgage. Okay. So you buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars, let's say, just to keep the number simple. What they'll do is they're, they'll charge you an interest rate. We'll say 5% and they'll amortize that over the, the course of the loan. 
And basically what that means is they front load your interest payments at the beginning of your loan and your interest payments will gradually decrease as you pay the loan off. You're going to pay off at a maximum of that 5% of the loan. You're never going to pay more than that 5% of the loan. But what they do is they make sure they get their money up front there and mm-hmm. then the principal gradually increases the further you pay down. What they're saying here is your student loans will be capped. One, they'll be they'll be based on what the Federal Reserve rate is plus a reasonable profit over that. Mm-hmm. So when you go and get a loan now, your interest rate that you pay on your loan is, if you get a fixed rate, it's based on prime rate plus whatever the bank is charging for their income there. And then the, the bank has to then pay their underwriters and all that stuff based on what they make from you. But if you take out a loan, I mean, basically what they're doing with student loans is like what a loan shark does. You know, I'm going to charge you 100% a day on what you borrowed. Mm. And by the time you pay off that $100,000 loan, you've paid $400,000. Way more than you borrowed. Yeah, yeah, which is ridiculous. And what the federal government's saying, no, you're going to not pay more than 10% on what that value of that loan was. So if you borrowed $100,000, the most you'll ever pay back is $110,000. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and, it, <laughs> and it makes sense. The, the problem comes with who's investing in those loans at this point in time. We'll mm-hmm. talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So the Levy Institute recently published a proposal for canceling all outstanding student debt. The federal government would write off the debt for which it itself is the creditor, the majority of which is the majority of outstanding student loans, and it would assume payments on behalf of borrowers for those loans that are held by private lenders. The population student loan balance would be reduced to zero, a radical solution to the student debt crisis, but one that deserves serious attention given the radical scope of the problem. Economists believe the student debt cancellation would be modestly stimulative to the macro economy, increasing annual GDP by $86 per person, which would bring us up to $106 billion per year. It would increase the demand for labor and therefore slightly reduce the unemployment rate. They argue that student debt worsens household balance sheets and that weakens and, and that weak, the weakness is one of the key mechanisms holding back economic growth. They go on to say that it amounts to around the same size in net dollar cost to the government as the recent tax giveaway to the rich, although with a very different beneficiary population. Yeah. <clears throat> you got to convince the rich white guys to let other people get some of that money back. That's, and that's, that's a hard ask. <laughs> that's the hard ask. Yeah. <laughs> So the other concept is free college, quote unquote, free college, free tuition at public colleges and universities, eliminate federal government's profiting on student loans, cut interest on student loans, allow students to refinance loans at today's interest rates, allow low income students to use federal aid to cover room, board, books and living expenses. Now, this is sort of like the wish list solution that they have, but some of it makes sense. So, for instance, nowadays, if you have a house and you bought your house 10 years ago and you got a 5% mortgage, which would have been exceedingly high, you can go back to the bank after a certain period of time and refinance that at a lower rate. You can't do that with your student debt. Mm-hmm. So if you got a rate of 15% on your student debt, which is essentially what a credit card rate is, you can never go back. You're always paying that amount for the life of the debt. Which is going to bleed you dry. Right. So you don't have, with student loans, you don't have a lot of the same rights Mm -hmm. and freedoms that you do with other financial loans that you might take out. And I think one of the things that pretty much all of these programs are trying to do is level that playing field to make it more fair. Yeah, I mean, that seems reasonable. And like, I look at things like this and it feels like it's by design, especially because it's the, the demographic of, you know, I think we said earlier, 18 to 29 year olds somewhat, you know, green to the world. And when you're taking on these huge loans that you then later have no control over, it's it feels predatory. Yeah. <laughs> Extremely absolutely. predatory. And and I think one of the problems <clears throat> that we're seeing now is a lot of different 
solutions are coming into play at different levels, different state levels. The federal government's got a couple in place. So nobody's coming out with a unified plan with this. Like, for instance, University of Michigan created the High Achieving Involved Leader Scholarship. Uh, ten the Tennessee Promise, which was adopted in 2014, offers two years of tuition-free community college or technical school to all high school graduates. All these different proposals all have pros and cons to it. And I think what you need is you need something at the federal level that melds all of these different programs together to try to give us really the the one-size-fits-all answer to it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, some of those other programs, you have the Education Trust, which goes with a scorecard program uh, based on some of the criteria, uh, following criteria. Uh, covers at least four years of tuition and a bachelor's degree at a four-year institution. Uh, helps low-income students cover living expenses, includes adults and returning students. Uh, no college GPA requirement above 2.0 or a C average. C's get degrees. <laughs> uh, allows students to enroll half-time, and the grant does not convert to a loan if criteria isn't met. Uh, how... However, no state program meets all criteria, like we were saying. Uh, but Washington's college-bound scholarship comes the closest. Some, uh, since most of the programs are relatively new, it is premature to evaluate their effects. However, an article by the Hetchinger Report points out that most programs do not give low-income students four years of free college. And failing that, quote, it's increasingly clear that free college, as it is often currently implemented, may be more of a marketing message than a policy that will boost the education level of the American future American workforce. Which sounds about right. If you can't actually do it, just make it sound like you can. <laughs> Get people to go there. And unfortunately, that seems to be a, a very political approach yeah. to this. Is I mean, Biden talked a lot about student debt when he was running, and he's, he talked about how he was going to try to forgive a lot of it, and, and that has, you know, there's no movement on that. So it definitely works, and people eat that up. <laughs> well, and he did sign legislation a few weeks back where he, he forgave something like $10 million oh, yeah, in right. student debt. I forgot about that. Ten million dollars, one point seven trillion. One point <laughs> seven trillion. That's like finding pocket change yeah. in the couch. It, if you it, wanted to be optimistic, you could say maybe that's a start. Or if you wanted to be cynical, you could say that he did that to get points. You know, just to look good. And that's that's really. I mean, that was almost done. That was political theater, is what that yeah. was. Because I can almost guarantee you that the ten million that he forgave, they probably had fifteen million more <laughs> in applications yeah. behind that. Yeah. Um, so you're not solving any of the problems with with this political theater, and really one of the biggest problems that you're gonna you're gonna run into is that it's the investors that you have to please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a reason for them to fix this problem? I don't think there is. That, They're making money hand over fist, and that's exactly it. Until you have a reason as an investor, because what happens is all the student debt gets bought up by investors yeah. because they know right now that it's going to get paid back so it's it's a good uh, risk for them to take as soon as the federal government comes in and decides they're going to wave their magic wand and make the debt go away all that investment money that's out there that's buying up the debt now is going to go away and you're going to crash the economy yeah. and I don't think a lot of people realize that so much of our economy is driven on debt the fact that our national debt mm -hmm. is what it is you know, if you make the debt go away, the people that invest in that debt are going to go away. Yep. That's what didn't that happen with the mortgage crisis? Like that was all based off of people's debt and who owned that debt. And then when things started to go under because people couldn't pay that money back, everything right. like domino effect fell. Right. Like people look at debt and think, oh, well, no one should be in debt. Debt should go away. Well, debt is like a commodity. That's like gold. Okay, so if somebody owes a hundred thousand dollars, somebody else is willing to invest in that because they know that that hundred thousand dollars is going to have a set return on interest rate. So I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars today if you're going to give me a hundred and twenty thousand a year from mm -hmm. now because it's a good it's a good wager. Yeah. But if you just make those debt go th that debt go away, it breaks the whole system. Right, it breaks the entire system. Yeah. And it's, I think that's the issue too because debt. It has a negative connotation, but in reality, it's necessary at, at this point, essentially. Debt drives the economy yeah. more than cash does. And the first thing the federal government wants to do is put more cash on the market when the economy gets bad. And that's the last thing you want to do because it drives inflation up. Mm -hmm. What you need is you need to have debt controlled in a regulated manner to make sure it's a guaranteed return. 
and give people the option to refinance things like their student loans sure. and, and give people a little bit more autonomy when it comes to these extremely, I said it before with the predatory practices that they're already doing sure. and have been doing. And what's happening here is your debt is getting too high and it, it's the debt itself is originating from people who don't have the means to pay it back. So therefore the risk to that debt goes up significantly, mm -hmm. which a lot of investors want to shy away from because they want to return. Could we see something like the the financial crisis in 2008 where it's all these people that are have gone to college and have taken out loans but have once they're out of college have no means to pay that back? You absolutely could. You figure it doesn't matter what your debt is. If it's more than $10,000, you can legally file for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So if every student out there who owes more than $10,000 files for bankruptcy, all those investors who invested in that debt are out their money. Sounds you like know, a bubble. <laughs> it, that's exactly what it is. And and this is why politicians are so hesitant to just come in and try to make the problem go away because they understand that it drives the economy. Yeah, what's riding on it, yeah. So it's it's a very difficult situation, and the future of it's pretty bleak looking. Um, <laughs> as with I was going to say, that's why it's things, on this show. <laughs> most things with this show, the future is pretty bleak looking, but but I'm sure we'll survive. Just become an electrician, you'll be fine. <laughs> Vocational, you may lose a few fingers, but vocational yeah. school is not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take our last break. We'll come back and, and we'll take a look at what the future does look like. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow. We are talking student debt, and we're going to take a look at what the future of student debt holds for us. So according to onlinecolleges.net, the silver lining in all this is that policymakers, college administrators, borrowers, parents, students, and prospective college enrollees are at least aware of the problem, and many are proposing solutions. So Nobody's pretending that we don't have a problem here, which I guess is a silver lining. <laughs> I, I think it's kind of hard to ignore the problem. So $1.7 trillion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. Pink elephant in the room. At least we're talking about it. <laughs> um, one popular route is to eschew the traditional four-year college in favor of vocational certificate programs, which you know we joked about here, but it's a legitimate yeah. route to go. In 2012, manufacturers reported that as many as 600,000 jobs went, to unfor went unfulfilled because workers lacked vocational skills. Hmm. My father used to joke around trying to encourage us to go to uh, college, which my father was not a very particularly encouraging individual. He wouldn't make a motivational speaker. He would tell us, well, the world always needs ditch diggers. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Appreciate that. They don't have debt. Maybe not. <laughs> no, no, they, no, they don't have any income either. But uh, they say, go on to say, in fact, uh, a recent report noted that 29 million jobs in the U.S. that require vocational skills but do not require a bachelor's degree and most award an annual salary of $35,000 or more. Now, I don't know if $35,000 is above or below the poverty line. I know $35,000 is pretty low. Uh, hourly, I don't know. I think that's probably about 15, which is what people are trying to get for a, a minimum, minimum wage. wage. Yeah. And minimum wage is traditionally always below the poverty line. 
They say some solutions look to change the terms of the loans themselves, which we've talked about. In addition to locking in low interest rates on federal student loans, some lawmakers are seeking to add provisions such as debt forgiveness for those who have made payments for a period of time, as well as suspension of interest accrual during times of high unemployment. Another idea put forward would allow borrowers with student loan debt to refinance at lower fixed interest rates in the same way people refinance their mortgages, yep. which we also talked about. This would result in a savings estimated of $14.5 billion for borrowers in the first year alone. Sounds like a no-brainer. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, they say many don't realize that Wall Street and thus lots of people with yeah. 401k invest in student loans to the tune of $291 billion. Additionally, the Department of Education owns another $600 billion in student loan, and the DOE generate a profit of nearly $51 billion from these funds uh, way back in 2013, which is how old this study was. <clears throat> so with so many powerful interests standing to lose by transferring this money back to borrowers, it's unlikely the bill, a bill like this will ever pass. Yeah, and I'm sure perhaps you listening at home have come to this conclusion. Uh, no one has a clear idea of what the future holds for education borrowers, but all agree that solutions are needed to ameliorate the student debt crisis. There's a problem, and we should do something about it. <laughs> Whatever more experts forecasting a burst of the student debt bubble like we just talked about, perhaps lenders and investors will have some incentive to work proactively with borrowers to make student uh, loan repayment easier. In any event, until we act, our young people will continue to face more and more debt on an annual basis. I am the young people, uh, and more and more doing it every year. Sadly, the bottom line is that student loan debt is a big business, and that is, I think, the core of the issue here. Uh, the people that are profiting from it at the expense of the younger generation of college students are also the ones being asked to make changes to solve the problem. So why would they change something if they're making a bunch of money from it? However, it's a problem that those investors created to their benefit. As a result, they aren't particularly motivated to take money out of their own pockets and give it back to the debt-laden students or the future of this country. And that really is the bottom line. It's just the people that need the changes are the ones that are making the money. It's almost like when you try to change politics for the better. The people that need the change in politics are the politicians themselves. And they're never going to do anything that that bites them in the hand that, that they feed themselves yeah. with. I think the only... The only real way you're going to see change is if people s would stop going to college because then those debt numbers wouldn't you know, go up as high. But I don't think that's ever going to happen. Well, what you'd really see change in is if people stop paying their debt and they file, oh, yeah. they file bankruptcy. Yeah. And then these people that are investing with their 401k and everything else. And it's, it's interesting they point out 401k. So it's not just these high-powered bankers that are making money off of it. You're, people don't realize where their 401k investments mm. go. And it goes into funds that that pick up these debts. So, like, if you have a 401k and you have a child that's going to college, could you theoretically be making money off of their debt? Absolutely. <laughs> Which you could also be co-signed to. How does that work? That's Absolutely. crazy. Absolutely. But, but it's one of those things where it's you're six degrees removed from it. Yeah. So you invest in a mutual, in a, in a fund. That fund has maybe bonds that it invest in, and those bonds are then being forwarded over to a bank or mm. purchased from a bank, and that bank is doing the the student loan. So you're pretty far removed if you're a 401k contributor. Right. Uh, but, yeah, you're contributing to that problem. Mm. So I kind of equate this almost to the, um, the issue that we have in this country with medical insurance and health care. You know, everyone says, oh, well, we need to have free health care. Well, no, you don't need free health care. What you need is affordable mm -hmm. medical care. Yeah. You know, you look at, at these other countries that have kind of socialist programs like Canada and, and the UK and stuff. They don't get free health insurance. They get free health care. And the problem that we have here is we want to tackle the insurance problem when nobody's looking at the expense problem. You know, right. it shouldn't. I shouldn't walk into an ER and get an aspirin and have that aspirin cost $500 and then expect the insurance company to pay for it. Yeah, and it's, and it's the same thing here. It's We're looking at the debt issue, but it's more of why is the cost so high in the first place of college. Exactly. Why has the cost <clears throat> gone up to the point that they can't justify that increase? You're not paying higher salaries to your professors to justify it. 
you're not buying new campuses or facilities or technology. Like they need the schools, the colleges need to justify the increase in tuition. And until they can justify that on paper, there's no reason to pay it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the government should be targeting. The government should be worrying about student debt because if you control the cost of college and the overcharging of it and the profiteering in colleges, that will automatically control your student debt. But on the other hand, at, at the same time, you also have to make sure that your student debt is treated as fairly as all your other debt is. Yeah, by giving people the option to refinance and things like that. Exactly. Tying it to a prime rate, tying it to a maximum amount of interest that can be earned on it. So if you apply the rules evenly across the board for debt, that would solve a good portion of the problem. If you solve the problem of why student tuition and housing, mm -hmm. like – the 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 uh, room that you were housing in, the dorm that you were housing in there, you were probably paying three times what you would have paid if you were a private citizen renting an apartment like that. I mean, I like I didn't have a roommate, so it was just me. But it was one room, and that was it with a bathroom. <laughs> so right. it's not like it was like you know. Well, it was a shared bathroom too, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. So, and the amount that you were paying, you probably could have got a two or three bedroom apartment yeah. yourself at a, a local apartment complex. Yep. So those costs have to be controlled, and until that happens, there's no point even trying to tackle the debt issue. Exactly. So anyway, I, I you know, it, as much as we are doom and gloom at the end we of the We actually shows, had some solutions this time. We did. And and I think some of these well, – the problem, actually, I, I think that the reason we did is the problem literally is so big, <laughs> you can't help but start throwing solutions at it yeah. and have some of them work. Yeah. Um. We're not going to solve all the problems, but I think if people stop trying to rip off our students and, you know, is, our students are, are the future. Mm -hmm. And if they're so laden with the debt, one, they're either not going to go to college, you're not going to be able to fill the jobs that we have, and you're going to, you're going to become a third-class country here because we don't have educated people that can fill the jobs that we need. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to have people that are so laden with debt, everyone's going to declare bankruptcy and crash the economy. Yeah, I was going to say that was our solution. We just tell everybody to declare bankruptcy and tank the economy. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the, you know, then you let the government deal with the consequences of that when, yeah. when the economy crashes. So, And then will they have to buy us out? There you go. That, well, there you go. See? <laughs> See? So anyway, that's our show for today. I um, appreciate everyone uh, listening and watching. Um, I would also invite folks once again to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions are available as Insights into Things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and so forth. I would also invite folks to email us. Give us your feedback. Give us show suggestions. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We do stream uh, five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch Prime monthly subscription. We'd appreciate it if you threw that our way. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast and on Instagram at insights into things. Or you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And I think that's it. Another one in the books. Bye. Bye-bye.